Hey guys, how's it going? So today I want to take you around our garden just to show you what's going on. There's a lot of beautiful things, a lot of beautiful plants. There's also a lot of big projects going on still. And I think there will be for all of this year, probably next year and probably the year after. <laughs> for all the years, we'll have projects going on, which is exciting. I wanted to start right here because you can probably see behind me. Uh, most of the gazebo is gone. It has changed our view so far incredibly in a very good way. I was uh, a little bit nervous obviously. I mean, it was a big structure. It was a huge part of this garden for so long. And I thought, well, even just having it gone, we're going to have this huge hole and I'm going to really miss just having a structure in that space. But as the roof of that gazebo lifted off, I felt a weight being lifted off this garden. It was weird. I didn't expect that. And at that moment, I could immediately envision the Hartley greenhouse going in and I really couldn't envision it before. So now my brain is just like churning with ideas for landscaping. And it was like the gazebo was uh, was a mental block for me. I had a really hard time with it. So you can see the vertical supports are still there. One of our friends is actually going to cut those off at concrete level and take them and use them. And then we're gonna start excavation process for the Hartley. Um, so that should happen actually in the next couple, like week or two. So it's gonna start moving really quickly now that the gazebo's gone. Um, also, you guys will be happy to know that I am ready to get rid of the bricks. It also another area that hasn't quite made sense. Um, the previous owner actually told me that they think there's a concrete slab underneath this whole area. I don't know. They weren't really sure. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see what we find there. But I think at this point, what I would really like is to extend this grass area and reshape it a bit because you know, these walkways are fairly narrow here. Um, and that leads up to our kitchen, which I'll show you in a minute. I'd like to widen that a bit and then have more of a green landing space right here. Uh, still keeping an area for seating because we actually use this seating area more than any other seating in our entire garden, which is crazy to me because this set, the previous owners, this was theirs. And they had two sets, this one and a set in the gazebo that they didn't really wanna have to move with them. Um, so we paid $200 for both sets because we didn't really have much to bring from our small townhouse garden to this garden you know it it's taken a while to fill up the space and we still use this one all the time so the bricks will go the brick circle area will go um, and i think that that will really change this whole entire view here in the meantime because i don't think we're going to actually start landscaping until either this fall or maybe next spring I did think about maybe popping some annuals in here, like a mini cut garden <laughs> right here where the tool shed once lived uh, because this is kind of out of the way, but kind of not. And, uh, you know, I want there to be pretty things. I don't want it just to be kind of a dust bowl for the whole season. So I'm thinking like sunflowers, um, maybe some salvia, some big grasses, just some really pretty color in here. I think it's a fun opportunity maybe to test some things because it's a full sun spot. Uh, the rest of this area, if you kind of look from like the angels to actually from the bench area, this is the French blend tulips from Color Blends. I mean, here we are May, what, 14th or something like that. They're starting to fade, but just starting to fade. They are wonderful. I had this whole area full of snowdrops, which you can still see here. And there's also a volunteer sunflower, Erin. Now I will say that this is the wrong spot for a sunflower to grow, so we'll pull that. We also have golden uh, rain tree seedlings everywhere right now. I could just weed all day long. Um, but the snowdrops were thick in this area. We planted 500. We had some in these containers, which clearly I have not made it to planting these yet. And then uh, we just decked out. I had a few left over from our raised bed planting, uh, so decked out this area back here. And I think that they are fantastic. I mean, the longest stem tulips ever and I love that they provide color so late in the season. Um, boxwoods are all looking really great. In fact, Erin and I have considered not trimming them this spring. Maybe that's a bad idea. I don't know. They look so good and so lush. I mean, we might tighten them up a little bit, uh, but there are some like the ones around our corner garden, which I can show you in a minute, that have struggled ever since we had that bad winter that kind of broke some of them. Um, and then we had, I think the winter after that, we had that weird cold snap in October and just certain sections have struggled. So I think we may let them just grow and kind of fill in and, re and rebound instead of just keep, you know, keep cutting them back. Uh, so we'll see what happens, but you'll notice that a lot of our hedging has got kind of its wooly look right now. So we haven't really done any landscaping right here, of course, because this is where the pines were. 
we came in, um, I dug up all the autumn frost hostas and the brunnera um, and just kind of cleared out this space in preparation and just really to open it up so machines can get in and out and, and that sort of thing. I'm hoping by keeping like from here all the way around pretty much the backside open that they won't have to get in this section because I'm not quite ready to move a bunch of those things yet. Uh, and the back flower bed, which is looking very lush at the moment. We're gonna head back there in a second. Um, but I just, I can't even believe like we're at this point right now. It's just crazy. Uh, the area around the angel, we've got the white roses here. There's some salvia. Um, this is the Japanese maple that I transplanted. Actually, Benjamin and I did from the backside of the gazebo. It's not looking so great. <laughs> <laughs> like there is some life in it yet and I will probably leave it like even these branches that haven't leafed out yet are still really flexible I don't know I mean it didn't come out with very many roots so I'm kind of thinking we'll give it a season and see what happens from there over here the hellebore bed is looking great we've got the lemon nemesia right here that's just I ever since I planted this haven't even watered it one time the grass sprinklers kind of hit this area which is perfect there is a Japanese maple over kind of near the pond pondless waterfall that I'm considering planting right here because this is a morning sun spot and it gets afternoon protection from all of this right here and I think it would be just perfect and I need to rehome that like quickly before it gets really hot we're supposed to get into the 90s like in four or five days um, right under here, the hellebores have really filled in. We had a single rainstorm and it like weighed everything down. Like this whole lilac was up and looking glorious. And now, and you could see underneath, now it's kind of hard. I'm gonna have to come in and do some pruning just to lift the canopy a little bit because I've got tons of hostas under here that are absolutely beautiful. But you have a hard time seeing them with that thing kind of weighed down. Um, you know, I'm noticing quite a lot of chlorosis this spring uh, in hydrangeas in particular. We planted these a couple of years ago and they've done fairly well, except for I noticed toward the end of last year that they were having a little bit of a hard time. I probably should have thrown some iron tone around them at that point and I think I forgot. Anyway, we need to start going around and doing some more iron tone treatment this spring. It's a little bit of a slower, um, it takes a little while for them to show like th that they're rebounding uh, but I want to get something in there at soil level so that they can start taking up what they need so we can get rid of this yellowing and then around this area of course this is one of my favorite views of the garden we always stop right here for tours because I love looking across here especially as the season progresses you can see all of the hostas like they're just starting to come up right now and starting to get big but like these will get up like this tall you can see I've got a couple of hostas waiting to be planted right there and I've transplanted a bunch of hostas into this space. Um, Foxgloves that I started from seed, white ones, came back this year beautifully. So that's exciting and quite a number of them came back. I planted, oh, I don't know, 12 or 18 or something like that in here. And the drift kind of goes back in underneath the lilac and I can see them all the way back to where I started planting them. So that's nice. Just added these hopscotch hookerellas into this area right here. I absolutely love them. I think it was the perfect addition of color. In fact, it makes me need, like I feel the need to add more uh, foliage color right in here. I've got some Limetta hydrangeas, again, showing some chlorosis. Like that's one of the biggest things we deal with in our garden. Um, but I thought I'm trying to get rid of this Tratoscantia. I keep pulling it up every single year and I will get on top of it one of these years. Um, so I'm gonna pull all of that out. So all this grassy texture will be gone. I just planted these pincushion flowers this spring from 12 in, or from four inch rather size cans. And I thought they would be really pretty to kind of fill in around the front of the hydrangeas. And then I'll pull out the rest of the Tritoscantia and then put in maybe a coleus or something really beautiful right back in there. I think that would add some depth. And I think it'd be really, really very pretty. I may even add in a small evergreen right into kind of that like hole right there. But I think that the hopscotch along with the pink and yellow columbine and the dusty miller right in here really pretty here's a wool this one needs to be trimmed i will trim this boxwood that one's like kind of a mangy mess at the moment and my topiary blue spruce my topiaries are gonna cease being topiaries here pretty quick <laughs> with all the growth you see i'm getting ready for a project right here in fact i'm hoping to plant that today and this whole bed is looking pretty good i enjoyed this so much so i had some 
charm offensive daffodils in here. You can see it, we need to deadhead those. And then I popped in some of this lemon nemesia this spring and it's just such an amazing annual. And I don't know how I, it took me so long to realize how wonderful of a plant, like maybe it's because these are newer varieties that perform better, but like I did Nemesia last year and I planted it in the landscape and it lasted the entire season for me. It was in a, a protected spot so it didn't get full afternoon sun and maybe that's the key, but an amazing plant. I've got the hellebores in here with the white stock that my mom got me and brought over this spring. Looks pretty intermixed together. And I think that's a happy jack clematis. It's, I think it's a jolly good or happy jack, one of the two. It does great every year. In fact, I probably, I probably should transplant it out of that and put it somewhere where it can actually grow on a larger obelisk because that one is a little bit too small. Pink mink clematis, I cut all the way back. I showed it in a video. Um, this one took a little bit longer to come out of its dormancy, but all three of them are going for it. Now, this is an interesting thing because this is a blood good Japanese maple that I've had in this container for four years? Five. Five years? I mean, it's a pretty big container. I don't know what the diameter is, but I'm guessing what, 30 inches, maybe 28, 30 inches. So it's done really well, which I've been so thankful for, but the tops, like the tops of all of our maples the last two years have been doing this. And I was about ready to remove it. And then I noticed, look, like it's pushing new growth on a lot of its branches up top. I'll probably come in and clean up, like I'll take this branch back down and cut it right where that new growth is there. And same goes for the other ones. I might just see what happens because I just, like I've had this tree for so long, it has a lot of life still left in it. It probably would be a good idea for me to get it out of this pot though and put it somewhere in the landscape. Um, that probably would help it because that could be what's going on. It may just be unhappy at this point because it's been in there for so long, but I was very excited to see some new growth. I even considered like growing a vine and letting like a vine fill in the top. <laughs> probably look like a total mess. Of course, this area is always really fun. Even with them looking woolly, I just this year kind of embraced, I think maybe the more natural <laughs> side of things because I feel like I have to with everything going on around here. It kind of is making me more, more peace. Like, you know what, if we get to the trimming, we get to it. If we don't, we don't and it's all good. Like the plants are healthy and they're happy um, and things are starting to fill in really nicely. More of the Nemesia here. I have since moved. I had two pots with the daffodils, Cornish King daffodils that were, I think that they lasted longer than any daffodil. Well, the Downless Hot and the Cornish Kings were amazing this year. I don't know why, but they just lasted forever. But I've really enjoyed the other spring look here. I do and will trim these up too. Any topiary in a pot, I think needs to maintain its shape a little bit, but I just put those in brand new this spring and I've really enjoyed them. Now this bed is starting to get really fun. It's been a little bit of a mishmash and I think it's partially my fault because uh, I've never addressed the drip system in here. Um, so we pulled out all of the old drip system and ran a grid in here. I think I posted a video of it on Instagram or something, or I showed it in a video, a tour maybe. Uh, and so now everything's getting proper water. So I feel like I can actually go to town with plants. So like I added this porcelain blue, is it Corydalis? I don't know how to say the, the botanical name. I had planted the five right here in a video and I decided that I wanted to continue the drift right here because they're supposed to bloom all season, like through fall. So if that is how these grow, I'm gonna be so happy because look at how gorgeous. It's like these two plants were made for each other. The autumn frost hosta with the blue corridalis. <laughs> one day, one day I'll know how to pronounce all the plant names, maybe. Well, maybe. And then I've also got some other things hanging out. I have some hookahs, which I had for the pondless waterfall fountain. Um, Greg and I went and just picked up some random plants that morning, um, whatever we could get our hands on. And so I've had those sitting here since last year. So I thought planting those around these incredible hydrangeas would be really nice. Um, it would bring a little depth to this area and it will eliminate the need for me to feel like I need to fill them up this area up with annuals every year. I'm kind of trying to get away from doing as many uh, like in-ground annuals because we do a lot of that already. So I kind of want to eliminate some of the areas. Right here, um, I've got some lupins ready to go in. Aren't these stunning? This is a variety called West Country, uh, West Country <laughs> Masterpiece. So gorgeous, especially alongside this hookah. 
which this is, do you remember what kind of hookah that is? Looks like a peach, some kind of a peach hookah. I'm sure I can find the name of that. Anyway, I think that the, that looks beautiful with the interior color of these blooms. Lupins are a hit and miss. Like I kind of almost think, I have to think about them as being an annual because they like more acidic soil than we have. So I'm gonna try my best to amend the soil here. We'll see what happens. I would love it if they came back every year. We'll, yeah, we'll just have to see. I've got some salmon colored poppies right in here. I planted a whole mess of them in here last year and only three of them survived. And I think it was because of the water issue that we have in here. Um, also, this is the double file viburnum that I dug up from behind the gazebo and planted in this space. That was like the best thing ever. Uh, I had a Japanese maple that again, had the top die out of it last winter. And so I dug that out, put that in here and it, everything's looking great. These are Empress Wu hostas. There's three of them I transplanted. There's another one back there from around the waterfall area. Uh, and I think everything's starting to blend. I mean, the white bleeding hearts are just absolutely beautiful. I have five more of those to work into this side because you can't tell because of all the daffodil foliage, but right here, I've got kind of an opening and an opportunity to plant more bleeding hearts because all of this grassy texture from the daff foliage will be cut off as soon as um, they start to yellow and die back. Uh, but I had peach cobbler and white lion daffodils in this area and it was like perfection and we just kept walking by it and just thought you know what we need to do that everywhere because it's just it's so pretty um we're kind of ending up where we started except for i did want to show you the tree peony that i transplanted from up front is blooming look look at that isn't that gorgeous now this variety number 28 <laughs> that's what it says i don't know what variety this is dang i typically don't leave my tags on my plants usually i just somehow that one randomly ended up staying but i am so happy that it made the transplant and we were able to see blooms coconut nemesia right here so this is another variety of nemesia i planted the same day as the lemon that's by the fire behind the fireplace and then i'm going to fill up this area maybe again with caladiums Last year I planted Chinook in this area and it was so beautiful. And I might even repeat, like the, sometimes you find something, you land on a plant that loves the spot you put it in and you have a hard time kind of getting out of that rut because it's just like, it's something about it just speaks to you and that's what you want to do every year. Okay, let's go this way. There's Cheddar chilling on the step. So right in this little area here, I have a Katsura maple tree, Japanese maple. Um, I have planted some uh, western sword ferns, right? I think that's what they are. Anyway, planted a bunch of those in there. And then all of the Brunnera that you see in here is from around the pine trees. So where I dug all of those up, they just came back here. And I thought that, that once they were established with the ferns, that would be a really pretty like textural difference. You know, the kind of long ferny leaves and then the big giant. I think those are Jack of Diamonds. Anyway but big giant bold leaf in there, leaf texture. Right here, the Delnasha daffodils have been so spectacular. The interesting part about it though, is this drift goes all the way back beyond that last seducer hosta down there. Those right there actually get more sun. I think that's what it is. They get more sun, those petered out first and then they like start petering out and then they're like still wonderful over here. Look at this. Look how pretty that is. Double creamy daff with the peach center. This one's even newer. I don't know if you can see that in there. It's got a little bit more fresh color on it. These have been just such a wonderful plant. Now this uh, Japanese maple was behind the pondless waterfall. It was like the kind of centerpiece plant. Um, once we started you know, removing trees and I knew it was gonna be full sun there, um, I got that dug up and moved over here, as well as there's uh, some Wu La La hostas that came from around the, the pond, autumn frost hostas. There's three I just transplanted in there recently. We've got the lung warts. I have so many things to show you like that I have dug up in videos. Um, the lung warts that we planted up front, these are the spot on and they're just going out of bloom right now, but they all took to their transplant really well. I've got a lot of Japanese forest grass, the Hakana Chloa, it's actually just intermixed all over underneath this Japanese maple. The silver gumdrop um, 
pucaras came back really beautifully as did the seducer hostas which makes me extremely happy because i told aaron actually i told him that i thought these three were dead i thought these three on this side were not were not going to come back and they just took they took longer than the other ones i don't know why this bed is very interesting in that uh, from about because we have this huge juniper so from about here over it stays fairly shaded until you get to the japanese maple and then from here to the other side of the circle full sun in the afternoon and then it turns shade on the other side of the lilac just kind of a weird deal look at this woo la la aaron you should show up from this angle because i just it stopped me in my tracks last night look how big that is like that is getting so huge I feel like I just planted it. And I learned that hostas, like the big ones, Empress Wu and Wu La La, they'll really only reach their full size if you give them quite a bit of water. So every single one of our hostas, they have drip lines running by them and sometimes, uh, in some cases, extra emitters so that they get a little bit more water. Foxgloves that I started from seed last year, and it's a variety that I cannot remember. It's either pink, pink gin, I think it's pink gin but they're a type that doesn't bloom the first year. So I planted them and just had to look at green leaves all year. And it kind of seems like, you know, you always want to have blooms and stuff from on the first year. You know, you want instant gratification. I do anyway. So to wait until this year to see these looking this amazing is awesome. So bloom stalks on all of them. We've got a beautiful bicolor salvia. We planted a few years ago here and I can't remember the name. We should put it on the screen though, because I do think this is really striking and very unique in a salvia. It almost has like a sparkly appearance, don't you think? Mm -hmm. So beyond the um, foxgloves and salvia, this is an oh so easy paprika rose, which is fantastic. I was just telling Aaron last night, we walk around every night with Samantha and, and Benjamin. Samantha loves being in a stroller. So we get her in the stroller, we walk around the garden and we were looking at this last night and I told them like, I didn't trim on this one bit. Like I didn't even look at this to see if there was any dead, dead branches or anything like that. This is just all last year. And look at how, like it's about ready to explode. It's just so pretty. And there's another Baptisia back behind it. And that's backed by Delphiniums, which will grow quite a bit taller. I did think, and I'm going to stake these Delphiniums. Everybody needs to like send me a message every day and remind me, go out and stake your Delphiniums. <laughs> Cause every year, I, I'm way too confident because in our last garden, it was so protected. It was kind of like sunken almost and we had fences all around and it was little um, and it was very heavily planted and I never had to uh, stake a single daff. I didn't have to stake anything down there. Um, but right here, if I don't remember to stake these, they'll be flopped over all over the place because the wind just nails them right here. So I needed to stake these. And then I started some uh, dahlias from seed this year, and I thought it might be pretty just to backplant this whole area with those. Anyway, I thought it would be really fun to maybe keep some of the seed dahlias separated from the tuber dahlias that we're getting ready to plant, maybe even this afternoon, um, and just kind of as a test to see how they do. Plus, I think it would be a beautiful thing, and I can't, I haven't decided what I want here as a more permanent planting, so dahlias would be perfect. By the way, starting seeds from dahlias is one of the easiest seeds that you can ever start. They're awesome. They come right up and they're easy to care for. So anyway, you guys should give it a try. Right here around the circle, we have Sweet Romance Lavender, which actually came back pretty nicely. I did lose one right here. Well, I guess I didn't 100% lose it, but I've got another one to replace it with. We didn't have any drip in this spot last year, the whole entire year. We didn't have drip in this spot until maybe just a number of weeks ago. So they weren't getting consistent water, which lavender, I mean, clearly it does okay without consistent water. We were just watering with a hose, but I think it would have done a lot better had it been treated like the other side. Now this uh, container I planted in the spring, it's still looking really good. I've got some hellebores in here, um, which the name evades me, but look at the leaves. Oh, they're so gorgeous. The dark kind of burgundy stem looks great with the rose pansies. We've got bull's blood beets in here. I wonder if they have beets. Not really. I don't think I gave it enough space. And there's some ferns in here. But it's on drip. Um, I planted it, watered it in that day. The drip was already running to it. I haven't touched it since. I haven't groomed it. I mean, you can see if you look in here, there are some things I could have kept up on a little bit better. But how awesome is that? Like to look really that good and to not ever have touched it. I say that's a win. Uh, the climbing roses that we took after in our video this spring, I'll show you on the chicken coop, how those are looking in the ones on our vegetable garden fence, the Colettes. 
but I hadn't really taken after my climbers as harsh as I did in that video and they are thanking me for it. Anyway, there's buds all over it and this was just like a few sticks left in here. They just do and benefit. They do really well um, from a good harsh training prune. Um, this lilac, I'm still, I'm a little bit like, I know I need to do a reju rejuvenation prune on it, which means like cutting the whole thing down. <laughs> That's not the rejuvenation. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, cutting it back all the way. Okay. What is a rejuvenation prune to you? I don't. Um, do you not know? Cutting it down just sounds like taking it out to me. <laughs> no, taking it out is taking the roots out. Oh, okay. So rejuvenation prune uh, means what I would do, Erin, is I would take out. I mean, this all this old growth kind of needs to come out mm. because a lot of it is dead. Um, it's so beautiful, which makes me so sad. But there's a lot of growth underneath which I think if we, it's done blooming now, if we took after it and cut it back, we could let it grow fresh from the ground or we could remove it and put something different here. Um, I don't know, I'm just not quite there yet because you wanna know why? <laughs> here, let me show you. This is kind of why I don't wanna take anything else out right now. We're kind of dealing with a little bit of a barren landscape at the moment, not for long, not for long, but you know, I think we should focus in on this now. This is the best year for this Japanese maple ever. If you look at it from the, yeah, that view and you can kind of see through to this west side garden, you can kind of see the vision of what I was going for over here. Now this one, uh, we got down at the garden center when I was still working down there full time. Um, and it came in one of those big wood boxes and it hung out forever because it was really expensive. Cannot remember the variety, uh, but it just kind of sat, which was a shame because it's gorgeous and it started to get sick because it didn't want to be in its box anymore. Eventually I bought it. Um, I didn't pay full price for a sick tree, of course, but uh, I got a really good deal on it. I brought it here, uh, planted it, and it struggled for a couple of years. And this is the first year where it's just perfect. And I actually like how the branching is. Like, I like that there's like this window right here. I didn't even have to prune it like that. <laughs> just how it came shaped. Um, so it's just really nice. Of course, we still have our front flower bed stuff. We've got our limelight hydrangeas in here, a dry hellebore, oh my. I haven't been watering this pot here and I thought it was still on drip. Shoot. Uh, we've got hosta in here. Uh, our planters are just kind of all willy nilly up here. Oh, I've got a hollyhock growing. Sweet, gotta get that out of there. Um, and then this front flower bed has remained untouched as well in terms of uh, uh, redesign. But look at these at last roses. These right here are, oh, do we have a bud? We have a bud, look, Erin, look at that. Oh my, and we have a swarm. We have a bee swarm in here. I should go get on my bee clothes. I should get my box out. I wonder if I, they would stay. I wonder. Oh my, that's kind of exciting. All right, let's, let's bust it through the rest of this tour. <laughs> I can go after those bees. They probably love it up here because of all the alliums. So we have alliums, ginger wine, nine barks, which I did cut the nine barks back when we um, took after these roses. And you might remember, I took the roses back very, very far. And that's how much they just benefit from a good pruning. I pruned the ginger wines back because they were like out of control, um, which in most cases that cuts off a lot of their spring bloom. But you can see I still have some beautiful blooms in there. Oh, can you believe that? Okay, I'm so excited. Okay, then we've got a calamagratis. This is, no, not calamagratis. This is a miscanthus ca uh, cabaret. This one gets massive and everybody needs to also send me messages every day to remind me to stake this one up. <laughs> when I don't stake it up, it gets massive and then it flops over. Um, but yeah, like six to eight feet tall and wide. I bought two more to put on the west side and I ended up using them elsewhere. Um, but you know what, this whole area is about ready to change. Well, it's about ready to change dramatically. It has changed dramatically. Um, it has really, I mean, ever since we got this front flower bed out, it has really, opened oh it's opened everything up it's given us a new fresh image of the house and how we want things done and how we want the front of the house to appear uh, from the road uh, and i had mentioned several times that we were going to have our house repainted this spring and that's we pushed that out a bit because of all of the well i mean all of the dust can you imagine if we had the house freshly painted and we got a, a nice stiff breeze which we usually do about every day like this is such a dust bowl it would blow dust like right into the wet paint i can just envision it so I uh, kept the crab apple tree up here and the ash tree. Actually, the ash tree looks better than it has in a while. 
I don't know what the what the deal is there, but I'm thankful for that. It's one of my favorite trees. But soon, um, the last things that have to be done, you can still see some wood, uh, not wood piles, some dirt piles out here. Those are gonna all be um, smoothed out. In fact, like this whole area, this is where the Quans and Cherry was that Chad dug out for us and we replanted in front of the high tunnels. Um, we're gonna have all of it smoothed out because it's gonna be lawn. So it needs to be very, very like non lumpy. Um, and then Benny's gonna come in and run new sprinklers, which so as soon as Chad's done with that, Benny will run sprinklers and then we can start thinking about seed in this area. If not seed, like even if we decide to wait until fall to seed, at least if we know there's gonna be wind, we can turn on the sprinklers and save our neighbors from a bunch of dust. So the other thing that we are gonna do, we just decided, actually Aaron the other night was like, you know, we should contact Natural Tree who um, does all of our tree work for us. So I texted them and asked if they wouldn't mind dropping by like, or if they even did this, if they offered a wood chip drop or something like that. Like if they had a fee where we could have them like drop off the wood chips, like I don't know what they do with them. And they said they would be happy to, we're getting like truckloads of wood chips for free. They're dropping them off on our property. And then we're just going to mulch all of the flower beds, all of the exterior areas that are not gonna be grass, we're gonna mulch them with wood chips and it actually comes with like leaves and stuff all shredded up too. So it's almost like a little compost pile sitting right on top of all of our soil. I think it will help with a couple of things. One, actually it'll, three things. I think it will help with soil health eventually because all those pieces will break down and become part of the soil, part of the earth. Two, it will help with weed suppression. Three, it will help with the dust. So I think that's a really good, I think, thing. Um, so they brought their first load this morning. Actually, we were setting up to start doing this garden tour and they pulled in right then. In fact, a couple of their trucks, they left them here so they could, I think they're running out to my parents to grind some stumps out today. Um, so they might be back with more chips for us. But anyway, they left a couple of their trucks, but they're just gonna be dumping a piles in that front corner. And then we're gonna use our tractor to pick up bucketfuls and start mulching that corner there and that corner where it's sitting in over there so yeah there's just a there's an enormous amount of things going on right here right right here right now and it's it is very exciting i do think we are going to dig these boxwoods out but we will leave the juniper and of course because i like the juniper with the spruce i think that's gorgeous and it's happy here and i use this for cut arrangements often so i want to leave that there this is going to become like a dry shade flower bed area uh, because we struggled with grass so much in this spot keeping it nice i kind of want to have like a little seating area so you can look out across the new lawn and look at the cut flower garden and it's kind of like this protected space and this space is the one that i wanted to do the little uh like fairy-ish fairyland like little kid play area underneath this the spruce because i think um, we can clear out a couple branches to where they'll actually be able to stand up and run around in there it's quite spacious in there. All right, so up here, and we decided that we need to stop calling it the Versailles Garden because there's really nothing Versailles-esque about it. It is a formal space. It's what the previous owners used to call this space. So we just kind of adopted it and kept calling it that. Um, we just yesterday got water to this space. We've been hand pulling sprinklers around for a lot of the spring. Um, so like flower beds are like a little sketch over here. Um, I haven't done a lot of pruning in these spaces, but the alliums are starting to come up. I do think we need to trim the boxwoods, at least in this space around the exterior. So I probably need to get on that pretty quickly because that that will maintain the very formal feel in this area, but it is nice to now have grass sprinklers in this space instead of pulling sprinklers. You know that my parents, you've seen their garden maybe, and we've done a couple tours in their space. Two acres of their property is fully landscaped and it's all terraced because they live on a hill. They pulled sprinklers by hand. So they did four sets, four sprinklers running at a time, 30 minute sets for however many years. Like, okay, so we moved in there when I was six. They got their sprinkler system well after we were married. So they pulled sprinklers for 20, 25 years. Whoa. And it would take like three days to get through the entire garden and get it watered. And you'd basically get like one or two days off and you'd have to start the whole process over again. I can't even, I mean, I can't imagine. That's so much work. Okay, up here, I'm ready, about ready to pull out these containers here. The um, Aromance Nemesia. If you have to pick one Nemesia, like don't look at the tulips too close because those are <laughs> needing to be cut back. This is one of the most fragrant annuals ever. They smell like a, like a sweet viburnum, like a sweet viburnum slash lilac. Mm, like honestly, I, would, I need to plant like bowls full of these near walkway, like doorways and stuff. 
so you get that smell when you're walking by. So good. So we still need to do summer plantings here and up on um, the patio there. There's a diaper on the patio, Erin. <laughs> We're crying out loud. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, Columbine looking awesome underneath the birch tree here. Love that color. Love it. I have recently, um, I planted some hostas around the front side here. We should go look at them quick. Oh, look at the view. Isn't that crazy? Like I just, I want those vertical posts cut down so that I can really see this space with like nothing impeding my eye. But it's weird, like I'll be inside and something will catch my eye weird because I'm so used to seeing that gazebo there that I'll notice like, oh, I can see the black lace elderberry in the back garden or the smoke bush or whatever, like, oh, there's an, actually a tree back there. I didn't even realize it, you know, cause the gazebo blocked so much. And the Hartley, um, while it's still gonna be, it'll be roughly the same size as the gazebo, but the roof line will be shorter by quite a bit. And it's clear, like it's glass on the top. So you'll still be able to kind of see through it. It won't be as so much of a, like it won't uh, block or impede the view quite as much. And it's gonna look so beautiful right there. Um, okay, so the front side here, I just transplanted one, two, three, four hostas. There's one up there, one right here. And then these three autumn frosts are all new to this bed that came from around the gazebo. So they're doing great. Uh, the wayfaring tree, this is a viburnum, just got done blooming. Boy, it's a stinker. This is such a pretty viburnum, but uh, cause like, look at the variegated leaves. And then all of these bloom uh, discs right here, all of them will turn into pink and dark blue berries. So totally worth having, but the white bloom discs in the spring, they, they're stinky. It's not a good smell in viburnum, but again, worth having in your garden. Okay, I wanna go look at the flower bed right behind where the gazebo used to be. The Hebe bed needs a little bit of attention. You can see you can't even see Hebe right now. We need to trim up the willow, cut back the tulips, but the pink perfusion salvia is looking great. There's a lot of things filling in nicely. We got variegated iris in here. Uh, we got a little mange factor going on. I haven't been in this bed for a while. Um, lemon jade sedum, Morden, blow, uh, Morden blush roses right here, like the most softest, delicate pink. And these right here form the biggest hips ever. So we let them bloom out once and I will deadhead them the first time. And then they usually bloom like uh, two or three more times, or at least once, if not two more times. And then toward that last bloom, I just leave all the blooms on so that they'll form those great big orangish red kind of hips and I can use them in decorating. They're amazing. Uh, backed by a ton of purple uh, irises, which you can see from the other side better. And the purple lilac is just getting over its bloom time. And then the hawthorn was in bloom at the same time as the lilac. It was really pretty at that moment. There's always those like fleeting moments in the garden when everything kind of like jives. I wish those moments would last for a little bit longer. So this flower bed here is the one I'm hoping we don't have to touch. I know that the equipment and everything will be getting in and around here. So all of this stuff, like we have a few more things we could move um, if we find ourselves with some time, but this flower bed is looking so great. I mean, the irises are gorgeous. I've got um, some hibiscus in here. Boy, I didn't give those hibiscus much space, did I? see how the, those do. We've got some uh, peonies I planted in here either last spring or the spring before. Um, some Jupiter's beard. There's Caryopteris. There's uh, hardy geranium. This is the Ann Fulkard hardy geranium right here. These like little puffs, bright pink blooms, beautiful, tough perennial. We've got Poet's Wife roses in here and Avatar blue spruce. Um, it's just a really pretty, pretty full bed. There's some delphiniums back in there. Artemisia, which this one, this kind of silver gray mount, it gets very big. And so it'll fill in this whole space. There's some distant drums roses nearby. Another Caryopteris. And then we've got like the blue chiffon roses Sharon. There's a quick fire hydrangea, some white Veron uh, salvia rather. And then on the front side of this bed, I planted some geraniums that I dug up from our front garden. They're all doing fantastic. They took to the uh, transplant beautifully. In fact, they're even blooming. So those, these are a geranium, are they Johnson's blue? I think they might be. Anyway, they'll fill in this whole space. Like they'll completely 
get big enough to, to be a mass right there. And I'm a bit reluctant, like I got very excited because I realized, oh, I have all of these little planting pockets to put things, but we do want to plant some trees back here. And I was waiting until the Hartley was in to kind of figure out how we wanted to design this area. I might pop some annuals in for now until we decide because like we need to not have these big soil areas showing. Oh, and I love looking through and seeing the fireplace and seeing the angel through this, this direction. I just love it. Corner garden, not much has changed. Um, this is what I was going to show you in terms of boxwoods. These boxwoods have suffered the most of any boxwoods we have. Um, that winter that we had, that uh, we had 52 inches of snow, it, it weighed a bunch of our boxwoods all the way to the ground and some of them stood back up and then they just kind of started to struggle. I have replanted a few. In fact, where was that one that I replanted? Do you remember? Right there, I, think. I don't think that was the one. For sure. You think it's doing that bad this quickly? Hmm. Either way, I think, uh, I think I need to either dig this part out and plant a new one or just let it fill back in. That might just be like, you know, prune out some of this dead here and then give it a chance to fill back in. Otherwise, like we keep cutting it back and it seems like we cut it back at kind of the wrong time or we think it's the right time and then we get some kind of weird weather snap and it makes the tops all brown. Um, we're also, two things, we're thinking about maybe once we do start trimming, maybe trimming more often and even through like more of the summer so that more of that undergrowth is exposed so that it's not so tender when we do trim it. And then we're gonna be using wilt stop more more religiously when we do some trimming uh, because that helps with moisture loss and, and burn like this that these are showing. So these are a little bit sad right now. The uh, clematis over here is gorgeous though. Bush type clematis, it's called Stand By Me. And I planted seven, I think, in this space and I have a, maybe a little bit of room to plant a couple more, um, but they are just the most dainty looking blooms really interesting really wonderful and cut flower arrangements because the stems if you follow them down i mean you can cut them quite long so you can get some really neat uh, structure in your flower arrangements they're underplanted with orange smoothie uh, day lilies right here which when they're in bloom it looks really pretty it's like a soft peachy orange with this blue um, and i got a few more so i got a few more of the orange smoothies to finish out my drift here because right here when we did plant this stuff this wasn't here there was a big pagoda dogwood that just kept dying every year. It had like something oozing out of its bark, out of its trunk, and it eventually just, it died and we took it out. Um, so I hadn't planted stuff here because all the branches were quite low. Um, so it didn't make sense. But now, like once we took it out, I thought, well, I gotta get more of those daylilies because now it looks weird. Um, and then this right here is supposed to get, what, 15 feet wide, I think. So we planted it far enough away from the fence to where at its max size it would be about here. So it wasn't like going into our neighbor's yard. So in the meantime, I'm thinking of plant, about planting some kind of a climber here and then some maybe annuals or even perennials because it'll be a long time before this spruce reaches that, that fence. We haven't really done an enormous amount back here. I say that every time we're back here. I do have some Atlas roses. There are six of them with a North Pole Arborvita in the corner. This is Tucrium right below, which is just starting to bloom. It just sends up little spikes, almost Veronica-esque looking spikes of uh, blue blooms. Um, I noticed, Erin, we have sunflowers coming up in this pot. <laughs> I, the sunflowers are coming up everywhere. I did not plant them in here, but at least they're in a pot. So I'm gonna leave these and see what happens. I planted some Coral Charm peonies. There's three of them in here. Bunch of buds, I'm excited to see those bloom. And the alliums are just about ready to, to open. A Couple of things in here. We have Budlia that I cut back in a video this spring. This is a strong tower. Is that what it's called? Black lace elderberry, I think. Grows more vertically than big like our other ones. That's a black lace variety right there. Check this out tons of alliums in there, just tons. And they're just getting ready to open. We have a Nepeta planted underneath. It's a really pleasing blend, I think. And then this bed is coming along. Um, I discovered in these hydrangeas that they had some kind of a cane borer. They had a borer inside of their 
branches. Um, and so I really need to figure out, I can't decide how I'm gonna treat that. They had a bunch of new growth though. So I took out all of the damaged and affected branches that I could find. And I thought like, okay, so for now, I'm just gonna watch them and see what happens. Hopefully I took everything out that had it. Um, Cause I don't, I don't wanna have to use anything unnecessarily, like an unnecessary insecticide. So anyway, but again, I need to treat these for iron. We have such high pH soil that a lot of times it binds up the iron in the soil. So although we may have iron in it, in the soil, the high uh, pH makes it to where it's not available to our plants. That's why we see that kind of damage quite often. The golden chain tree is just coming out of bloom. It's looking amazing. Really, really pretty. Oh, <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder who's been out here. That's a Benjamin right there. Uh, the tricolor beach is spectacular. Isn't that the most beautiful tree ever? So we planted that two springs ago, I think now. Was that two springs ago? I think. And uh, um, we broke a main water line. I mean, there's like a big water line underneath here. And when we were digging the hole, that broke. Uh, and so it was kind of an ordeal but it has put on, it's put on some really great growth. Like this is new growth right here. So you can see last year's growth. This is kind of interesting. Last year's growth is more brown and that's the start of this year's growth, which that's a quite a bit of growth for a beach. I think that's really great. And I love how the new growth kind of uh, droops, kind of gives it a very graceful appearance. All right. <laughs> Now I gotta show you guys something really fun. Look at all of these plants. Look at them. Now, these are not all for our garden. In fact, you may have seen the videos where we've started to plant up some areas down at our community college. Many of the plants you see here are destined for projects down there because we still have 31 containers and three large planting areas to do down there. So, you know, you can imagine a lot of these things will go for that sort of thing. Um, but a few of these things are gonna go in our containers and a few projects yet that we have to do around here, but there are some beautiful things, you guys. Look at the honey. Is that not the most beautiful that you've ever seen honey look, Aaron? Yeah. It's, Isn't that striking? That, is, that looks like a different plant. It does. Like that's more pink than I have ever seen it. And it could be, I wonder, it got down to 37 like two nights ago. Do you think that maybe that brought, the cold brought out the color maybe. There's a couple of really exciting things. Like this right here is a James Britannia. Br Britannia. I'm not familiar. It's a new annual called Safari Dawn and there's one called Safari Sky somewhere out here too. Um, but I'm gonna try these in the container and the landscape this year, see how they do for me. Um, but they're beautiful color, I love them. And there's a really fun new um, sunflower. So the Sun Credible is one that we've planted quite a bit. This is a new one called Saturn. So it has more of like a burgundy ring around the bloom. Actually looks really pretty with those lattes right there next to it. Look at that. Oh, mm -hmm. That's nice. There's lots of fun stuff. Oh, I um, ordered myself. This is a treat yourself moment. I ordered a halo lavender hollyhock. I ordered, there's a flat of eight of them. And I thought these would be so pretty because they grow like six feet tall. These would be pretty just clustered somewhere on the new property, just in one of the flower beds, just some tall lavender flowers. And they can seed themselves out there and I'm totally great with it. And then I also got some more foxglove because I wanted to have more for cutting. I was gonna put them out in the cut flower garden. I don't know though, with the wind we have out there, I think I might tuck them into the landscape and then I'll feel like I can't cut them again because they'll be part of a <laughs> flower bed at that point. Um, but yeah, this is just so exciting to see all of these things out here. Um, we typically keep our annuals, like we don't normally get this many annuals in. So we usually have room for them in our greenhouse, um, but not this year. We had to keep them out here, which I think they're happier in the end. We just recently planted up the barn containers. So those are looking nice and tidy. And then we've got just a couple more areas I wanna show you. A lot of the bulb pots, I've just been like texting friends and just saying, okay, so who wants some daffodils <laughs> or who wants tulips? And then they come and they just take the bulbs out of the pots just because we haven't had time. Like I would love to plant all those bulbs out on the new property, but we don't have the drip line set up out there yet. And I don't even know where we would put them and we haven't had time. So anyway, it's just been kind of a joy to be able to gift them to other people this spring and they can enjoy them in their gardens. Um, but 
we've got a little bit of a mess going on now here. We will be cleaning this up and then placing uh, pots around the garden um, in more groups and things like that uh, and getting them planted up. The allium troughs and my jug of wilt stuff. I couldn't find this the other day. <laughs> Apparently this is where I keep things now. Um, alliums are looking so great in these troughs. And honestly, so I was gonna put them out at the end of our raspberry beds, which are not quite done being built. So I didn't wanna get them in the way of uh, the guys building that. Uh, but I've really enjoyed them right here. We actually are out here all the time. So we've been able to really like see them every day, multiple times a day. And this is what they look like when you plant them in tubs. I think it's such a beautiful look. I love the strappy leaves. You can see that like some of them are just maybe starting to go out a little bit, starting to fizzle. Um, but we will be putting all of these in the landscape and I think I'm gonna plant blackberries in these tubs later on or possibly sweet potatoes or maybe both. I've got all those plants here and I think that the, they would do really well in these tubs. Okay. Is that where that goes? Well, for now. <laughs> uh, last spot I wanna show you is a vegetable garden slash west side. So Paul came in here and did a brick border. I'm pretty sure we've showed that in a tour before, but he did a fantastic job. And we're gonna toss a little bit of grass seed. I think we meant to do that this spring and kind of forgot. We still have time, but I think it would be nice. And the grass will eventually work its way over to the border. Um, and I think for now, I, we're just gonna keep this a nice little grass area because Benjamin loves to play under here. He comes under here and he like dances below the willow. It's quite like magical looking. Um, and then he likes to lay out here when I am working in the greenhouse. So it gives him a place to run around and he plays with the cats out here and such. So I do um, want to tackle these flower beds though because they're really just nothing at the moment. Um, I've got some Colette roses, which this is one of the ones I pruned in that video. Loaded up with buds, just everywhere. It's about to be spectacular. But there's nothing in this side right here. And I think all I want to do is just cut the grass out and just round it so it's easier to mow first off. And then it'll allow me for like, I could put a shrub in here and some other plants. Um, if we come around this side, you can actually see that the Colette is blooming. Oh, look at that. So here's one that's, that one's fully open, obviously. This one is just starting. And we've got buds. Look, just look at all of these buds. See how good roses do after you prune them? I totally forgot to show the ones in front of the chicken coop. Maybe another day. <laughs> it's probably getting to be a super long tour. So real quick, I'll run through the raised beds here. I've got onions in this bed. We've got spinach and peas going in that bed. I realized the water was not making it to that bed until, like I was supplementing a little bit with the hose, which I tend to do when I plant seeds. And then drip kind of helps, but the drip wasn't running at all in there. So. Anyway, I think I need to toss a few more seeds in. The tulips in here are now done and gone. Um, lettuce is starting to bolt in this bed. We've been cutting on it and cutting on it, but the chickens are gonna have a feast here pretty quick. And I've also been, um, I ran over this with the cart the other day, but I've been pulling this kale. So it started, the rose started right over there. I've been pulling it and giving the chickens a handful every day. Uh, so they have one more day's worth, it looks like, right there. But there's onions, green onions in here. There's beets on the backside and carrots right here. Uh, in this bed, we have Italian garlic, which is going to be good. The stalks are all beefy and healthy. Uh, we've got some Copenhagen Market cabbage right there. And then we've got ranunculus in this bed. They're just starting to bloom. It's so exciting. So these are La Belle Champagne right here, kind of like a beautiful apricot right there. Ranunculus salmon, hmm, <laughs> yellow. I've got some dill coming up actually from last year in here. And then these are a white picotty right there. The buds everywhere. So we're about ready to see some really beautiful growth here. Um, we've got ranunculus in this bed as well. Anemones in that bed. Take a closer look here in a second. Benjamin likes to carry this around. More Italian garlic, some red cabbage. Ruby perfection, I think is what that is. Uh, there were some bul uh, tulip bulbs in here. In these two beds, I've got tomatoes and things I'm ready to plant. More onions and strawberries, one volunteer sunflower. Hands off, Erin. <laughs> and then look at this. So look at these, these are the pastel mix. Look at how gorgeous that is. And there's some light pink, some kind of buttery, creamy yellow. And these are the white with the black eye. 
super thrilled with how these have done. And then another Colette rose, which <laughs> even with that big and major of a prune, it's still like Colettes are just vigorous roses. So you really probably wanna plant these on a wider trellis or you wanna come in and cut on these, but there's so many buds that I kinda of wanna let them bloom first and then we'll shear them up so that we can comfortably get in and out. Um, and then the west side here, there's not a whole lot different in here. We did plant some Supertunia mulberry charms. Um, I'm trying to decide if I wanna put a crab apple here or if I wanna leave this north winds maple right here. I don't know, there's just a lot of fun things going on and I think that's actually where we're going to end the tour. Oh, this is an instant karma elderberry. I guess I should say that because this is a pretty beautiful shrub. It's getting ready to bloom. Look at these big dis discs. These will be full of white blooms. And that's it, you guys. I hope you enjoyed it, just kind of seeing the State of the Union where everything's at right now, um, because things are just rapidly changing and it's a very exciting year. Um, out in the Cut Flower Garden, which we could probably do a second tour out there, I have a lot more planted. Raspberry beds are almost done. Um, we're gonna start construction on the shed and the orchard here, like in the next, hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, so that whole space will be evolving as well. So anyway, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today and watching this video and we will see you in the next one. Bye. Mm -hmm.